Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this week's uh, episode of Fake Accents Unite. I am joined this evening by the Britisher. What ho? And by Discordia. Hey there. Uh, we are also meant to be joined by Uzulu uh, shortly, but he's eating right now, so he'll be uh, here in a minute, no doubt. But we were just discussing the Britisher's uh, great new piece of artwork he's had commissioned for himself. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now so that everyone can behold its magnificence. Present to everyone. There we go. Here we are. Very. Uh, yes, that is all down to the um, the the uh, ample talents of Mr. Cordev. Who Both of them. Who's, yes, who is an absolutely outstanding graphic artist. And uh, yes, uh, we. Uh, as I was just saying to you. Um, we spent more time actually talking about the various possibilities with him making sketches um, that it actually took him in the end to finalize it. He works incredibly fast. Um, no, he, he is he is very good at what he does. And uh, I think he has made quite a few um, avatars for quite, you know, quite some people, including yourself, I dare add. Indeed, he, he's made my lovely, uh, my lovely avatar. I still prefer the... Uh... Of course, the the alternate image for your. Uh, oh no! Has been no, done. we don't. No, here we, don't. Here we are. No, that because I know that, 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 that purple <laughs> really worrying. That. <laughs> the purple is just it, it clearly means it to represent me as he wishes I was. Yes, I have asked him to you. stop. I've asked him to stop projecting. I mean. I wouldn't leave the house if I looked like that, yes, to be perfectly you're, honest. You're the first person to draw my attention to the purpleness of the gown. I had ne it had never really, um, you know, it no, had never really struck me. But Most people would say gown. <laughs> uh, well, yes, indeed. Um, whereas you immediately drew it to mean it being the same purple as the background in your avatar. I, of course, um, instead interpreted as a UKIP lady clinging to my legs as I stand there. <laughs> uh, Silly Sailor says, am I the only one imagining Britisher with Princess Leia in a gold bikini? Uh, I, I take that to mean he's calling you Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> that must be it. I'm, I'm definitely Jabba the Hutt. No, no contest there. But you see, I have something that may intrigue you even more than this particular piece of artwork. Oh, do tell. Um, because I am, at the moment, sitting here sipping tea. Oh. And um, it's a particular type of tea that I specially ordered. It was an, it was one of those, um, what do they call it, add-on items uh, when ordering something on Amazon. Don't tell me it's British tea. And it is indeed Trogothnan tea. Amazing. Mm, it is great British tea, and it actually makes a decent cup, I must oh, say. Good. How does it stock up to your usual Yorkshire? It is... Well, it's it's definitely something different. Let's put it like that. Um, and once I saw the packet, I kind of see um, how they didn't end up in the uh, in the sort of in the other goal, because um, I since have found out there is another type of British tea. Right. I can't immediately recall the name. No doubt, anybody who Google's it will find it in no time. Um, and it is Scottish. Right. In in Scotland, there are, you know, uh, two or three tea plantations. Um, so I think there is one particular one, which seems to be the best known one, that sold, sells under the name, you know, um, markets itself online and something, the wee littish little tea company or something like that. I'm pretty sure, like, the Scots seem to have a knack for growing things where they shouldn't be grown. Well, and I think they <laughs> will them through pure Scots. Just pure stubbornness well, into existence. Yeah, yeah. If you think of it, I agree with that. In India, um, of course, the tea plantations are not in the tropical parts of India. They're in kind of mountainous, damp, rainy, um, foggy places, which, you know, does kind of correspond with Scotland. <laughs> um, but if you look at the prices for the uh, wee little tea company, mm. uh, you will suddenly find yourself paying £35 for a, you know, fairly small packet of tea. Um, yes. And that is, I think, what they avoided with Trigothnam. Um, and the way they did it is that this is a blend. Because if you look on the packet, it will say British tea and grown in, grown in uh, Britain in Cornwall. But the, you will see it then says in the small print, 
blended with the finest Assam. Mm. So they must be blending it with Indian tea. Oh, and that's rubbish. Well, therefore, they seem to be able to keep the price down. So my little packet of 10 tea bags cost me four pounds, which is still astronomical for, you know, for, for 10 cups of tea. Mm. Um, but it's something you can do just as a one-off in order to find out what it tastes like. Um, I'm not sure you would necessarily go as far, you know, with thirty-five pounds for uh, a Scottish um, version. No, I, I, I've seen that um, the Scots have created garlic, which they shouldn't be able to grow either. Uh, in great quantity, there's a, a a big. I remember seeing a like some bizarre like mini documentary, or it might have been just on the news, where they couldn't get it into any supermarket in Britain because it didn't fall under any category of garlic. So they just categorized it under European garlic. And then they had to have it form a, um, like it had to be the correct size and weight. So, so and that's shape. why they want to stay in the EU. Obviously, well, no, protect their European garlic. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but Sainsbury's basically told them, no, you can go do one. Uh, that you need to have much smaller garlic that needs to be a much different shape. So uh, therefore, this they said that's a load of rubbish. We don't it do that. Sounds to me as though they were actually just using haggis and camouflaging it as garlic. <laughs> so oh, do you get to choose the size and shape the garlic grows? You you don't really, but uh, the, but you'd be surprised at like the stage at which it's picked and uh, the kind of garlic that is bred into existence through time. And they had created their own strain that was bigger and had more clothes, etc. And Sainsbury's were basically like, no, it needs to be smaller, it needs to be rounder to look nicer for the customers. And so now I think they just sell to high end restaurants because it's incredibly good quality garlic in a huge quantity. So well, the, the frightening bit about the Scottish tea is that uh, they seem to be winning prizes for it. So it does, once again, seem to be very high. <laughs> Those damn Scots doing things better. They, they uh, really are, are frightful in that regard. Um, it's that stubbornness that's added in. It really I mean, adds I, to I the remember, quality. You know, please don't condemn me for this. I, I might, might have mentioned uh, my reading this book once before. Um, and that is, I, I did once read a book on the shipping container. Yes, um, I know you have. And uh, I, I remember the Scots featuring quite heavily in that because uh, the chap who invented the container got the contract for supplying American troops based in Europe. So basically most of them in, in Western Germany. So, of course, it meant that he had all his shipping containers going on ships across the Atlantic uh, to take all these goods to the American troops. But they were going, they were going back home empty. Mm. So he was desperately trying to find something um, which he could ship back. And then he stumbled upon the Scots, who were having massive problems with their shipping of whiskey. Ah. They were calculating um, in break, book, break bulk holds, they would lose 10% of their stock because the dockers would help themselves to whatever uh, they could find. To whatever they could find. So 10% at either end. So they would lose 20% of the stock before it actually get to, got to where it was being shipped. <laughs> and he then came and said, look, I've got these containers. You can lock them. And the Scots just thought he was the messiah. I mean, they yeah. just they couldn't believe. Revolutionized it. Yes, he, he finally had something which he could ship the other way. And like that, he managed to introduce the, the Europeans gradually to the idea of the shipping container. Amazing. Antopia says garlic should be the size of pumpkins. I think it would be quite difficult to uh, crush the garlic cloves if that were the case. Well, that sounds to me like a French dream and, a, and an English nightmare. Can you imagine? You get out your wheel of cheese and your single giant clove of pumpkin garlic. <laughs> you need a hammer to crush it. You just be in the kitchen like whack. No, you, you can't crush it because if you do, then everyone within a three mile radius will be in <laughs> floods of tears. Um, <laughs> let me see. Uh, Silly Sailor says, I'm going to switch to coffee bags and instant tea just to be non conformist. <laughs> well, I can say that, uh, that picture you're showing is a drastic improvement upon the original. 
That's what I said. Welcome, right, Uzalit. I'm leaving. <laughs> He's already gone. <laughs> you can't stop. If uh, anyone in the chat is gifted with Photoshop, I will welcome many new images of many faces of other YouTubers, etc., photoshopped in the place of that face. <laughs> uh, v comes to mind. That might be entertaining. V comes to mind because I thought that was V for a minute. I think you should take that as an insult. To be honest, <laughs> it's it's the hair. That's what I think it is. Or think, it could be it could be the massive. It, um, it could be the tits. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Jugs. Mm. Anyway, um, Discordia says, "I am jealous. I only have normal tea. Why are you speaking in chat, Discordia? You speak up. <laughs> speak up." <laughs> um, binary surface says, "Now all we need is a Mancunian, a Scot, and an Irishman." Uh, to complete the uh, to complete the cast, is that it? Of uh, British fake accents. Uh, we'll say three. Well, we have a Scot right here. I I know we got three Brits and a Scot, and a Scot, which is why I think they said uh, a Mancunian for some bizarre reason. Maybe they've got a soft <laughs> spot for pets. I have a Mancunian. It's uh, it's it's called a whiskey. <laughs> I see. You guys know Mister Whiskey. He's cool. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can, of course, only um, point to a certain, uh, you know, a certain duo of very nearly viral, in which I actually recently did a video, um, you know, uh, proffering my opinion on uh, on Mancunians. It didn't go down well with them. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Well, I you, did it. Right. you did it correct. Yes, you did it well. <laughs> Right. Um, well, obviously it was a humorous attempt, but um, and, you, and they obviously joined in the joke. But I have since on Twitter received one or two questions: what my problem was with Mancunians. Well, the trouble is, is that British humour being dry humour, it doesn't go down necessarily as well. Um, shall we get on to our first topic of the evening? I think. Uh, oh, those sort of says Maine Coons are amazing. <laughs> Uh, sure, but not quite what we're talking about. Uh, speaking of tea that you brought up, Britisha, I have this rather phenomenal clip from ITV News. This is beautiful. Boris Johnson, who recently made comments uh, uh, comparing um, Muslim women to looking like letterboxes. Formerly, the artist formerly known as Boris Johnson, now <laughs> nationally known as the Tea Fairy. The Tea Fairy, <laughs> the tea fairy. indeed. So... <laughs> If you'll this is quite me. possibly the chaddest man in the country. Oh, you know it. I'm going to uh, I'm going to just pull my headphones for a second and then uh, let everyone hear the audio for this because he is just Boris. Yeah, sure. Go on, have a cup of tea. Thank you, thank you. Do you have a cup of tea? Do you regret your comments? Do you regret your comments? Thank you very much. There you go. Do you regret your comments, sir? I want you to have a cup of tea. If I have a cup of tea, will, will, you, will you answer <laughs> no, my question? No, I'm, I, that's, I'm here solely on a humanitarian mission because you've been here all day and you've been incredibly patient and incredibly, and I feel very sorry for you. Because I have nothing to say about this matter except what you said. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Go on. Okay. Go thank on. you. <laughs> it's just, it's just phenomenal. I have nothing to say to you except to offer you some tea. I have a meme for this. <laughs> it's good. Nobody, nobody actually mentions the pants. I mean, they're actually they're photographing away. You can hear the cameras going in the background. Nobody actually mentions the pants. The pants. Where have I seen this? They are exactly what a Chad would wear. Oh, they are strong. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. That is a true Brit in the middle of, as you can see, a blazing British summer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's> clearly... <laughs> he looks like he's just baked up, goes to his paddling pool out the back as he barbecues something. Oh, all he needs is, like, his hair as well you can just see that uh, phenomenal what a response I mean, please you know you, you may have had the barbecue going out back and he may have brought them sausage sandwiches later <laughs> <laughs> no, perhaps a butty. Please just name, <laughs> name someone anyone who you think in british politics could do this the only... up in a top like that with pants like that saying do you want a cup of tea <laughs> oh, boris 
who's the only person <laughs> is Jacob who's Mog, but that would have to be a bit different. I think. No, Jacob J- JRM has to Mog Mog would have to turn up in a suit because he only ever wears suits because it's easy. <laughs> Yes, and he loves it. He would never wear wears a suit, and someone would carry the tray for him. <laughs> yes, with white gloves, um, and so on. Oh, I've seen this comparison. One second, here we are. If you're aware of the uh, the little butler from uh, from Tomb Raider two <laughs> in the house <laughs> that everyone locked in the fridge yeah, as he arrives. Fridge. <laughs> <laughs> so why is Bud Johnson acting like that annoying butler from Tomb Raider? Love it. Um, but was uh, it the, uh, the meme I sent? It's it's a good uh, take. Oh, is it in the uh, sidebar? Let's, let's yes. have a look. See. Redirect. The virgin paper cup versus the Chad mini egg mug. Min- oh yes, I have that mini egg mug at home in in the in my cupboard as well. It's amazing that it just seems to be something that's made its way into every British uh, tea cupboard. <laughs> selfishly <laughs> buys tea for herself. Eyes as black as the night. I don't know, as black as the night. As, like Palpatine's eyes, maybe. Grey ancient you hair. After the transformation? Oh, oh yes, of course. <laughs> the, light, the lightning of progressivism has been reflected into her face. Mm. Uh, makes her look 20 years old. Scared of putting a foot wrong. In a constant state of apology. Dressed like Bond villain. <laughs> and free court cafe tea made from store brand bought in bulk. This is where... Um, Peter Hitchens goes mental over the skimmed milk involved and the fact that it's a war on like healthy natural products. <laughs> oh dear. Well, you see, it I mean, we're always just assuming that this was just Boris being Boris, but you know, it, it would be deeply disappointing if in fact, you know, there was kind of a a, a committee of PR experts wondering what pants he should wear, what top, in his what house. kind of cups he should take outside. <laughs> um, take take the cream egg one. Yes, take the cream egg one. <laughs> it will make you look like every man. Yes. I love. I, I love. Think, I think if if such a committee exists, they have succeeded by using the wrong approach. I mean, <laughs> if they were going for a PR dress up, they have severely failed. But because it's Boris, it works. I don't think anyone could possibly have predicted that. <laughs> This is just Boris being Boris, but equally it was a genius PR play. So you can't well, take it from him that he might have been somewhat planned. Th- that is just something extremely Teflon about the nature of Boris. It doesn't matter what happened. I mean, do, you remember, do you remember when he was on that ripcord or whatever? And he was dangling there with his Union Jack flags. Mm. And that was in the run up to the Olympics, wasn't it? Um, it would have more than likely been the death of any politician, but he survived it without a scratch. And it just Can you imagine um, uh, Miliband doing yes. that. I mean, it just uh, just consider how troublesome it was for Mil- Miliband to be photographed trying to eat a. <laughs> <laughs> no, just just trying to eat. That's the end of your sentence there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's before we even get to his, uh, you know, party political tombstone. Does anybody remember that? Not specifically. No, well, he, no, um, he had the Labour Party manifesto carved in stone to the <laughs> tune of something like £15,000, if I remember rightly. Oh, yes, I recall. And they, they put it up behind him and then he got absolutely shredded. <laughs> yes, and the idea had been, we will make this, we'll kind of make this stone monument, then we will win the election, and then we will have the stone monument cut into little chips of stone and sell them individually, and like that will make our money back. That was the actual plan at the time. Amazing. Here we are. And yes, yes, I think everybody would love to know now where that giant stone is. I guess it has been cut up into little pieces, but not sold for very much money. (laughs) It's now part of of a bypass for the M6 or something like that. (laughs) The 8 foot 6 inch 2 ton slab of limestone with 6 key pledges carved so that they wouldn't be abandoned fair. after the election. <laughs> Thirty thousand pounds. Thirty. Oh, sorry, I, I only had estimated to, it. to produce a balls-up, twelve-foot granite marble cock-up. <laughs> <laughs> Whose money were they betting on this loser I, winning? I love the fact that he said that he would carve it up and sell it off to make their money back, but that means that they'd be breaking their promises. Yes, <laughs> <Surely. very much. laughs> quite well, literally. 
Yes, but obviously they intend they, to break a promise and like chip it off. They were kind of <laughs> intending to kind of sell it as paperweights and whatever. Um, that that was the idea, uh, but obviously that never that never materialized. And I would just love to know whether it's kind of been broken up into aggregate and forms part of a motorway somewhere or something. Sadly. Perhaps we can recoup the costs to the nation in uh, Miliband's actual tombstone. <laughs> oh, savage. Um, sadly. It would, be, it would be funny if when Miliband one day dies, let's hope that it, it's far, far in the future from now, that they will, the people will suddenly realise that his grave has an extraordinarily large tombstone. Yes, it is. Like... And it's only, it's only when people look from the other side that they actually realise that it's recycled and the Labour promises are still on the back of it. Oh, I have no doubt most of them would say something along the lines of, uh, isn't he compensating for something? Um, mm -hmm. It's sadly in a warehouse in Woolwich, by the look of things. Oh, uh, although it, um, they won't respond to The Guardian, although Lord knows why, being the pillar of uh, journalism that The Guardian is. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> my understanding is that more than one person with a sledgehammer was involved, carried out in anger and panic. <laughs> well, you see, when it's, it's on, de it's in days when the Guardian asks the Labour Party where that tombstone is. It's on those days that even the Guardian belongs to the alt right, as far as the Labour Party. Concerned. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. The senior, a senior Labour source who decided to be very edgy said, "All requests for comments on this matter will be met with stony silence." Ah, puns—the best way to handle the public. Oh, get wrecked, basically. But uh, no. It would have been funny if Boris had said it. Yeah, it would have. <laughs> the, the man with a cup of tea calling the media great supine protoplasmic invertebrate jellies well, on I'm live just, TV. I'm just kind of waiting for the opening of Parliament. Uh, you know, first day, and Boris just walking down the aisle of Parliament with a tray asking people, do you want a <laughs> cup of tea? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I think many eggs are going to want royalties for his uh, prime ministership. I think that he, yeah, they're going to win him the election. The mini <laughs> eggs alone will have won the this election. This is going to be the prime ministership sponsored by Cadbury's, is it? <laughs> I'm, I'm loving so intently. This, this, this is all on uh, ITV News, but I am absolutely loving the like mixed comments. But, but then again, given the fact that the Conservatives are currently wondering whether they want to throw him out of the party or not. And given that the Cadbury's uh, brand colour is purple, <laughs> one just wonders if there is something going on here. The mini eggs is written in yellow as well, so it just gets better and better. Yes, it's just, <laughs> can you imagine if Boris Johnson ends up leading UKIP? My God. He would um, more than likely have to arm wrestle Nigel Farage. For the leadership. Oh, I don't think I think Farage might make a comment on it, but I don't think he really wants to go back into politics. Oh, by I the think... sound of it, he is already eyeing up a particular constituency. I think it's Peterborough. Peterborough. Well, after his horrible uh, losses in Thanet, South Thanet, wasn't it? Um. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Demonetized. <laughs> Sexism. Very strong. Very strong. <laughs> Um, I love that someone who, where has it gone? Someone, yes, Dr. Lohi Babu El Pula, which is an incredible name, uh, said wholehearted support, to which someone replied, what sort of doctor are you? <laughs> doctor with the wrong opinion. How, how can you? <laughs> oh, dear. It's just amazing. Love ad hominem. It's great. Um, <laughs> I just love the shorts. It's just amazing. And the high Tory gang on the socks. Yeah. <laughs> that is phenomenal. Uh, right. <laughs> I think this is, this is final evidence, though, that, that Boris doesn't have someone to dress him. <laughs> no, obviously. He's uh, one of us. He's a working class hero. <laughs> although <laughs> some people believe that he has, uh, he has staff inside who could have done it for him, but he chose to come out because it's all media manipulation. And you just go, I really don't think that was going through his head. I really He's just think he was inside. like. I you... think they were probably oh, yeah. like, no, please don't, please I, don't. I'm sure, well, I'm sure they're used to him as well, and he would have just gone and got up and go. Do you know what? This is ridiculous. <laughs> they know I'm not going to say anything. I guess this is this can't be anything but good publicity for him. I, I mean, truly. Um, however, speaking of uh, this is amazing publicity for Boris. Let's move on to Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> 
uh, who has been pressed over <laughs> terror memorial claims this week. I, oh, I heard about done this. Now. Oh I dear! This, I didn't read it. I'm. What I hear is he was there, but not really involved. Except that he was holding the wreath yeah, exactly. and putting it down. He um, happened to have a wreath in the area. <laughs> was, oh, he normally carries it for this too. Have you not He's seen him sit through the countryside with a wreath as we all do? Have, have you not <laughs> seen him sitting uh, on the floor of, of Virgin Trains with his customary wreath? <laughs> it's like <laughs> truly. Um, well, there's um, the so shocking thing. There's a quote from Hagrid. Have got news for you. So uh, my question would be: How many martyrs of the you know Arab or Palestinian cause, other than those people? who are, you know, believed to have been involved in the Munich attack, how many sort of possible martyrs could have been buried at that graveyard? Indeed. Because I don't believe Tunisia is really a hotspot for, uh, you know, sort of martyrdom, uh, because they're not, they're not near Israel, they, they don't seem to have any, you know, immediate connection, they haven't been at war with the Americans or any such thing. So... That is where the the reference seems a little confusing. The only thing I know about Tunisia is that Tatooine was filmed there. But <laughs> do you want to? Uh, do you? Uh, I've got one here for you. You might be interested in. Um, sure. that I I saw on on Twitter this afternoon, and I um, decided just to make a little polite ahem. I saw this um, because yes, oh that one goodness. really. Um, how does one talk oneself out of that one? It's not his hand, it's someone else putting their <laughs> hand up from the bottom of the screen. That was clearly photoshopped on there. Yes. He has no hands. Uh, to be fair, <laughs> everyone's thumb, th thumb folds over like that if you hold it. I mean, everyone poses like that for photographs, don't they? So, so <laughs> that really does beg the question. Um, Jeremy, what actually were you doing that day? How long before <laughs> the guy on the left there turns out to be like an actual literal jihadist who's killed a bunch of people? Oh, dear. <laughs> These are amazing. I have uh, another tweet for this that I'll I'll send you. Shockingly, Hignify are actually criticizing the left. Who are? Hignify. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. They say, sympathy pours in for Jeremy Corbyn from other people who have accidentally stumbled into a wreath-laying ceremony while taking a leisurely stroll through northern Tunisia. <laughs> <laughs> I caught that, yeah. that one. It was beautiful. Yeah, amazing. There's also a reply to that, um, which is a, a quote from Stalin, which I don't know if it's accurate or not, but even if it's not, it makes the point, which says, "I was present. I was present when death warrants were signed, but I don't think I was involved in it." <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure that is not an actual quote. Working, not working. Be, I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> working class bloke who's. Uh... Well, put it like this: If he were to have given that as an answer, ask yourself, who asked him that? Hmm. <laughs> You know uh, what Jeremy needs to do? He needs to get a tray of tea. He needs to get himself <laughs> a cream egg mug. You know, you know full well that the only mugs in Jeremy Corbyn's house are red. And he, he doesn't have tea. He has vodka. I mean, if, if, if Boris is the Chad and Theresa May is the Virgin, how fucking low down does that leave Jeremy Corbyn? I mean, what is what is ten stories lower than a virgin in this analogy? <laughs> Honestly, I tripped, fell, and landed on this wreath. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, a working class bloke is a uh, he's a great lad actually. I know him personally. There's the stalling quote. Like, yeah, I love it. It's just I I, I hate it, but at the same time, it's just <laughs> it's coming out, and you just go how how could this would be funny if it wasn't so unfunny? I think it's hilarious. I, I think he, at every single turn, there is nothing that he can do that doesn't screw him over at this point. It's like... It's, the, the most amazing thing is, is like, how can they be doing as well as they're doing, even though they're doing really badly? Theresa oh, May. The, the, yeah, exactly. The, the, the degree to which they're not like completely dead in the polls is the degree of May's failure. Yeah. Dominic says, Jeremy Corbyn's the only mug in his house. <laughs> <laughs> that oh, could be true. Dear. And you just go, look, Jeremy Corbyn seems to, I, I do think he's quite charismatic when he, when he goes for it. He's, because he's, even though everything that he stands for is a disgrace and, and uh, what he's going for, um, and he knows full well that everything that he's going to gun for will lead to death and destruction and he really, really hates the West. 
Um, we have a lot of people. No, no, go on, go on. <laughs> That's what you really think. <laughs> what? I was, I was gonna. You were, you were listing a bunch of things. I was implying that you should just continue listing them because there were so many more. To oh list. yeah, we could keep, we could just keep going. Yeah, for... Yes, we wanted to know <laughs> what you really think. <laughs> Dear, but, but believe it or not, when he first came onto the scene, I was quite interested in what Corbyn could do for the country. But my goodness, he has just taken misstep after misstep after misstep, and and just because the man is an he's either an idiot, I mean a complete and utter idiot, or an incredibly dangerous radical who should I never have reached the position. He got to. I, I, I think he's quite clever, and that's the problem. Mm, I, I think that he has uh, is very principled and he does want to see the downfall of the West as he knows it today um, and has very, very like I. But I, the thing I don't get with him is the friendliness with Islam um, and, and not just Islam, because there's, um, the, he's not connecting with moderates in Islam. He's connecting with the worst of the worst. <laughs> That he could find, you know, it's a good thing there's not an ISIS outreach group, or he'd probably be shaking hands with the leader of that well, right now. I'll tell you why. Um, he's one of these people who is a idealistic pacifist, who, um, and the, the the only way that you can be a pacifist is if no one is fighting you. And in order to be a pacifist, which is something that's deeply moral, morally rooted in his ideology, so he's not getting rid of that. In order to be that, he has to believe that he can talk everyone out of being violent. So he goes straight to the most violent people to talk them out of it. It doesn't work, obviously, because that's not how humans work. No, and he just capitulates. And so you get things yeah. like him he, saying, oh, I'll compromise and I'll throw up the hand gesture, but they will very, never compromise back. It's very similar to the uh, what I think is the, the core tenet behind everything else that comes out of the radical progressive ideology, which is that all people are beautiful. I always think when you when you're assessing an ideology, when you're assessing what really lies at the bottom, if you're not if you're not saying it's something positive, something that would actually appeal to a reasonable person, then you're not being fair to it. And I think that that's what's at the root of the progressives. It's it's something that they think is positive. All people are beautiful, but then mm. out of that comes so much pathology that we see today. Yes, and blindness to when people aren't being beautiful. That's the um, main the main yeah. problem with it. Yes. Conaty says, uh, and I think, I, well, I phrase it slightly differently. It's like uh, one of the reasons why Jeremy Corbyn is still trending so high is who would you rather go down the pub with, Jeremy or Teresa? Neither. And I know neither, right? <laughs> Boris. <But laughs> if you Boris would be there, <laughs> just because you know he'd be an absolute You'll animal. You opportunity to get into a bar fight with one of them. <laughs> <laughs> with them or against them? Against them. Oh, dear. I don't know. Maybe, maybe hiding under that is the uh, the strong will of the socialist is a shredded, uh, you know, sort of like almost anime esque, like completely zero body fat Jeremy Corbyn, who's just completely is uh, like been building up this muscle over the time for the fight for the for the leadership. Mm. <laughs> you know, I can I can sort of imagine that comically as Jeremy Corbyn's body in an anime or something, but it, even in anime, it just doesn't work with Theresa May. I'm afraid. No, no. The only thing that works with Theresa May is the prequel Star Wars films. Are we, are we, are we talking Palpatine or Grievous? We are definitely talking Palpatine. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, the only thing she's missing is the hood. Let's let's mm. face it at this point. Um, Joan Everton's a bit more like Dooku, but without any of the Im imposing well, presence. When it, when it no. comes to her Palpatine-ness, so to speak, I mean... Are there really any? Are there really too many people who are in doubt that she had something to do with Gove stabbing Boris in the back? Just, oh, I have no know, doubt whatsoever. At the time of the uh, the last Tory leadership election. Then again, Gove is a spineless opportunistic twat, so I wouldn't put it past him to just do it himself anyway. But well, I'd stab himself in the foot as well at the same time because he's now yeah, unelectable. That's just his own failure, though. Yeah. It's almost as bad as Jeremy Hunt trying to do anything nowadays after his absolute failure to manage the NHS. Um, Joe Neverton says, everyone forgets that John McDonnell also exists. Yay. John yeah, McDonnell, the man who said the man who said he sees it as his duty to dismantle the UK government and impose socialism. But he's also on he's also on YouTube somewhere on a on a clip calling for insurrection, isn't he? Yes, I, I think I remember seeing that. I don't remember that word specifically being used, but I wouldn't be surprised. He does say that he's a Marxist and he, he reveled in the uh, economic crash 2008. Oof. 
You silly sailor says you don't want to go to a bar with Corbyn. He'd want to sit on the floor, stage a photo op, saying we need to nationalise the bars so that drunks can get a seat. <laughs> don't give him ideas. When someone would hand him the darks, the people would start getting nervous. Yes, it's mm-hmm. when he, d- but he'd have to do it in an empty pub at the same time, right? So <laughs> it's like because I've been the question of um of Boris being an idiot uh, or or just a, a massive radical. Mm. I think it's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, and, and that's not to say half and half uh, of, of each other. I think um, he is, he has a lot of political experience, which means that in practice, he's not really an idiot. Uh, but if you took him out of the political sphere, he would be. I think he's got lucky to get into the position he's in now. He got there at a, an opportune moment um, when radicals could appeal because the centre had done so badly. Mm. But if not that circumstance, he would... Um, he would only have his political experience to rest on and no actual intelligence or ingenuity. And that's why, he, and he has, he has no sort of uh, self-awareness. He's mostly acting on animal instinct. That's it, why he never examines his beliefs, never examines why he does things and the flaws in his uh, ideology to any significant degree. Mm. Although it might be something else. Boris, um, personally, I think has come at... He's always he's been like unfireable o- over the course of his career, and I I still don't understand why he just seems to have this innate ability to play power politics like basically no one else on the scene at the moment. Another couple of these uh, T stunts, and mm. he'll be a shoe in. Yeah, I mean, like so, Mog came on the scene mainly because of his reaction to uh, uh, both. Brexit and the uh, talk he was giving at university, which got raided when he just basically got down off the stage and walked up to them and said, what are you doing? Do you want to have a conversation like civilized people? And then the, the news was like, weren't you scared? Weren't you scared? The media. And uh, and he was like, they're British. No, of course I wouldn't be. <laughs> what are they going to do? Attack me in front of their peers? That would be ridiculous. And, uh, and so, of course, people were like, okay, the toff is here. Let's uh, um, maybe he's there, but he again continually rejects the mantle of embracing the idea of a leadership position. And I could easily see Boris um, just taking one step towards it, and at one point, and people just throwing the support behind him. Genuinely, mm-hmm. but uh, Philip Mason says, "Who who's going to replace Corbyn if we get rid of him?" Though that's the question. Yeah, it could um, get even worse. But, well, it would um, need someone with awesome. real leadership qualities, like Diane Abbott. Oh, <laughs> dear. Don't, don't, that's, that's not a joke one makes lightly, Britisha. That's, that's truly well, terrifying. Like David Lammy, then, if you... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, like, I don't know who would do it, because... They've driven quite a lot of the, like, more moderate people out of the party, haven't they? I Almost can see. all of them. You wonder, because the Tories are split with the Brexiteers and the Remainers, and they're falling apart. The Labour Party is split between Jeremy Corbyn's socialism and Blairites, who are now mostly gone. So they're all adrift. And the Blairites can't vote for the Tories, so they're trying to form a centrist party. And UKIP are set up so that they can win seats in European Parliament and not constituencies. So they are not in this next leadership election going to go very far. Although they, if they restructure, they might do a bit better, but it's going to take a little while. Um, so I have no idea who could, like, <laughs> where people are going to end up. Like, we could end up with a coalition government we could end up with a labor government or a tory government but i i think more leaning towards the tory side because sort of better the devil you know but i, I don't i can't imagine a weaker government than a coalition between may and corbyn oh no neither <sighs> me either the two are just too well they're not diametrically opposed they are economically but the um uh, on a progressive sense, they could unite behind Bash the Fash without realising that they are the ones being totalitarian. Mm. <laughs> I think there's a decent prospect for both No Deal and a no-confidence vote in May that could result in a Boris leadership. Mm-hmm. Both of those would be good outcomes, as I, as I stand, um, given the current circumstances, and both seem fairly likely. 
Yeah, I, I can't call it at this stage. I like this. They are not deliberately, perhaps, but they are maneuvering into a position where they could take up the challenge. I just don't know whether or not a leadership challenge is going to be forthcoming before the next election. I really don't. Um, Didn't a bunch of people already like start a vote of no confidence in it? I don't know if you yeah, they didn't, or not. didn't get enough right. letters. Yes, not it was yet. a matter of how many letters were being sent in. And even with that many letters, you then need to have a secondary vote, which has to have two thirds party majority or something in order to uh, to pass. So uh, and, the and fact that they of, couldn't get letters is sort of one of the problems with the Conservative Party is that nobody wants to be nobody wants to be the one who actually is the official challenger. That is the well, only reason Theresa well, May is still there. Well, I also I also who wields the knife, never wears the crown. That's the problem with the Conservatives. That well, I, I also think none of them wants to be the one responsible for the strife that gets Jeremy Corbyn elected either. Um, yep. As in, if the leadership challenge either fails or succeeds is irrelevant. If if it gets spun in such a way that it seems like the Tories are in complete disarray, then well, yes, Corbyn but... gets in and they fear that almost more. You know, in, in a way, the, the continued presence of May is a is a disaster for them because the only way Corbyn can really win is if May stays in play in place. Mm. I mean, you know, look what she did during the last election. Yeah, she's doing more damage than she good. should have won in a landslide. I mean, the the poll yes. predictions at the beginning. She were, somehow managed to lose uh, an unlose a majority of of over one hundred seats in Parliament, and she managed to reduce that to not even having a majority. She I managed mean, to she, her doing. She managed to lose an unlosable election. Yes. That was I'm that. not so sure it they, was accidental. They, know they can't go into an election with her at the helm. Mm -hmm. So as long as they have her as the leader, she effectively is in a position where she can literally blackmail them. Because she could just, you know, um if if some if it really comes to an election with her at the helm, then they're really screwed. So she, Nobody can ever push anything to a situation where it could come to a vote of no confidence in Parliament. She really is a selfish bint, isn't she? Uh, just a tad, yes. <laughs> yeah, I agree with your perspective, and unfortunately she is holding the, the threat of Corbyn over their heads, but it's, it's, that's a short-term threat, but the long-term threat is it'll happen anyway if she stays in power. So you, Precisely. you, you, you yeah. must act now. They should have they, they should have acted right after the general election. They should have got yeah. rid of her. She should never have called that general election in the first place because we had more important things to do with Brexit. Mm. Uh, so she kind of played that, wasted a huge amount of time in which we weren't really keeping our eyes on Brexit at all because we were in mid um, general election modus. And then she completely screwed that up. And at that point, that is when every leader who really screws up in that way goes. And she didn't. She she didn't do the honourable thing. And that in itself said enough. Um, so, yeah, I, I really think that they have to get rid of her. The, thing that, the big thing is, have they got the strength within to actually do it? Mm. I think without, without Brexit or without the uh, Corbyn, uh, she would have been gone ages ago. But with both, that's a big impediment. Yes. And, of course, they've also got the issue that there is a great camp within the Conservative Party that is the Never Boris. There yes. A considerable faction in the Conservative Party. Those are anyone the coffee drinkers. Boris. Those are the coffee drinkers. And think it it up, now. I'm sure with the, uh, with the Remainer coalition inside the Tory party. Well, I think a lot of the, it's not just the Remainers, it's also a lot of the sort of Tory establishment, the grandees. Um, mm. If you, uh, you know, uh, what's he called? The chap who's on with Andrew Neil, um, Michael Portillo. I know he's no longer in Parliament, um, but he has got very strong opinions on, on Boris Johnson. And once in a while, uh, Andrew Neil teases him, teases him about them, but he never officially says it. But it's it's quite clear he would, be willing to have anybody, just not Boris Johnson. So there mm. seems to be quite a strong faction within the Conservative Party who think that way. You wonder, what do you think about David Davis then? It's uh, a real shame that he 
didn't show more strength during the negotiations. I mean, the discussion between him and um, Rhys Mogg, where Rhys Mogg was challenging him, him on the, the deal before even Chequers, um, being essentially vassalization, a vassalization for the UK, um, Rhys Mogg was mostly right on that, and Davis was still defending it. And even though I know Davis kind of had to defend it, it is a shame that he didn't show more spine throughout that. Well, I think one of the problems David Davis had is he can only negotiate the position that the government provides him with. Yes, I know. I and, understand. And in that. that regard, his his hands were very tied because he was he was always a very strong um, leave advocate. So mm. I, I really doubt he will have gone in there, you know, playing with kid gloves on. Um, yeah. I mean, he, he isn't remember, man, to begin clearly. with, he arrived yeah. with a great many lawyers and he challenged every single point they were making with lawyers and said, prove to us that you're entitled to this. Mm. So he was it, playing hardball at the beginning. Yeah, he's clearly an intelligent man, but even if my point is only to say this, uh, that will not reflect well on him. Oh, no, I mean, of... it, it, it clearly doesn't look good for him because mm. he will be partly blamed for the muddle in which um in in which brexit is now because he's effectively the name that is attached to it but in mm. all fairness i think we have to be somewhat lenient with him because i really don't know what more he could have done i think before eventually he was you know his his resignation was accepted i think he had offered it seven or eight times mm. and he had done it in order to try and force the government to take up positions which he could actually negotiate. Mm. So he was basically saying, look, you cannot send me, as we are now, back into the room with Barnier. I need to have something over which I can actually negotiate with him. We have to have a position, at least on this or that. So every time when push comes to shove, and the only thing the cabinet wanted to do, or Theresa May wanted to do, was kick the can yet further down the road, he said, look, it, it just won't work. We need something to, to talk about. So every time he ended up having to threaten to resign, which of course made him look ever and ever more ridiculous. But it illustrated what for a hideous position he found himself in. And it's uh, even worse because the guy that replaces him is far less resistant to May. Well, I mean, you know, given that she is now effectively in charge of the negotiations and he is assisting her, so that is now the way it is being shown. So rather than refusing to give um, David Davis a position from which to actually negotiate, now instead she is essentially the negotiator and he is merely the assistant because that now seems to be the way it's been spelled out. Mm. Well, yes, I understand that Davis had little choice there, but it's still souring to see him defend that thing that he clearly didn't believe and that Reese Mogg yeah. was right about. And so it does diminish his um, his favorability below Mogg and um, Boris, in my estimation, but still still high enough that I'd be far more satisfied seeing him as PM than Theresa May. Yes, but I'm not even sure to what extent he was kind of angling for the leadership, if you know what I mean. I think he, mm. he kind of gave up on that some time ago. Yeah, he doesn't um, seem to have been pushing. Particularly that. when he resigned, when he re when he resigned his uh, his uh, constituency seat in order to hold hold a by election in protest of some of the um, some of the surveillance and and you know cuts to civil rights that were going on. Um, when that happened, I think everybody kind of realised that at that point he really forfeit his um, his kind of leadership ambitions. Because I think, I don't know if, if you're familiar with that, he did do that at one point. He, at one point, he was a leadership contender. I think he ran against Michael Howard, I'm not sure. But uh, at some point then, I think during the, uh, the David Cameron years, he, um, he basically, out of protest, resigned his position in the cabinet and even resigned his seat in parliament and said, look, uh, if you want me to be someone who speaks out against... Um, what's going on here with you know much too much surveillance and whatever then i am willing to be your man but i am putting myself up for re-election so you've actually got a choice in that matter so you, you can either vote for me or you can vote for someone who would be you know a more traditional tory so to speak i see i i wasn't aware of that context and it so i was i was pausing then to let um 
not so obvious champion because I assumed he would know something about it. But it seems yeah, like yeah, we seem to be out. losing. We, we him. have lost our. our yeah, host. he said in the chat that there's a power cut. So um, oh. I guess we're in charge of the stream for now. Okay. Yeah. So let's run it into the ground, shall we? Yes. Back <laughs> moment, let me find my best gay black porn. Well, yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's probably watching this on his phone right now. Like, no. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, it just shows how important this particular live stream has become. That there are government agents pulling the plug on the electricity grid. True. Wherever True. it is, that not so obvious lives. <laughs> I'm sure I can expect mine to go out momentarily, especially if I say something like Boris for PM. Yes, or, or just just whatever you do, don't mention Alex Jones. Oh dear, I've done it. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, yes, I mean, apparently, you know, people like, I think it was H3H3, wasn't it? They got taken off air whilst yeah. they were talking about that particular story. Yeah, PewDiePie did a reference to that in his video. He was he was about to talk about I it, but then the about that, actually. icon comes up, and uh, yeah, he he over over that tweet, and he uh, he didn't for that reason. <laughs> yeah, I mean things like that do seem to be getting just a tad Orwellian, but I think more than likely this stream is is uh, is of, of insufficient scale to uh, attract quite that attention from YouTube these days. What's obvious, you can feel offended by that comment from the Britisher. <laughs> you could have just said under the radar. Come on. Well, that is that. Yes. Hey, uh, not so obvious in the chat is saying, no, not the interracial pornography. I never mentioned interracial pornography. I said black, black, gay, black porn. That's not <laughs> Come on. So yes, we we seem to have um, we seem to have more than actually exhausted the particular subject we're on, which is more than actually where we're stumbling a bit. Uh, well, what? I was I was reading more messages in the chat. There appears to be one person in chat right now who's who's messaging a lot more than the others. Um, yes, he seems to be called not so obvious. I've noticed. Yeah. Um, but you know, perhaps not so obvious could give us a hint as to what the story of Jack Whitehall was, because I have absolutely oh, no idea. I actually do have this. I posted this earlier. Let me see if I can find. it. Discordia to the rescue. <laughs> the question is, where did I post it? Lots of obvious is asking, what is life? And I assume also, baby, don't hurt me. And possibly, don't hurt me. And possibly also, no more. Chat will get it. You guys, you guys, you guys are boring. Yes, that went completely above my. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I recognised some sort of song lyric in there, but it, it, um, it's a meme song. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Liberal Zardos, I don't think face hitting porn was ever banned. I think the production of there it. Is I put it in the sidebar. Bad. Jack Whitehall, row as Jack Whitehall chosen to play Disney's first openly gay character. Okay, um, so once I've stopped cringing. <laughs> <laughs> does this article... I assume this was the one you were talking about, not so obvious. Does this article include instructions on how to care about this? Yes, yeah, so uh, we're assuming that Jack Whitehall as a person is not gay, is, is that it? So he is playing a gay character, although albeit that he himself is not gay. Is that the controversy? Because yeah. we seem to have a similar controversy at the moment with Batgirl, don't we? I heard about that. I've seen this story a hundred times before with different names and different identifiers, but it's the same story. So effectively, one must be gay in order to play a gay character. Well, it's it's the obsession with um, representation, which is essentially. Um, uh, a form of virtue signaling. I don't think they have it for any other reason. Yes, but and I mean, they... all that is completely forfeit because um, we are more than likely still in the money. Um, because the amount of gay characters who have played straight characters over the years um, without officially being gay um, clearly makes up for all of this. So who cares? Yeah. I mean, problem, let me just mention Rock Hudson. How many films did he make? 